Hi everyone and welcome back. This is Professor Hall and today we are going to talk about how to analyze rhetoric. The definition of rhetoric, as we see here, is the study and practice of effective communication and the ability to use language effectively, especially in argument and persuasion. So if you are taking this class with me, not just watching this on YouTube, we've actually been talking about rhetoric already. So we've talked about things like audience and purpose and tone, the way that the author writes to an audience, the barriers that might be there. And we're going to recap those things, and then we're going to talk about persuasion specifically and the three pillars of argument, so the three strategies that an author might use to try to persuade their audience. So let's get started. Purpose. Purpose is the reason or goal that an author has for writing about their topic. So when an author goes to write, they don't just uh, want their words to be in print and they don't just want money, although that could be one of their reasons. But really what we're talking about here is the type of writing that they're doing. So why are they trying to give you this information? Are they persuading the reader to think or do something? Are they informing the reader to give information to help the reader understand a particular concept? Are they expressing their feelings, emotions, or opinions, or are they writing to entertain? Sometimes they might have a combination of these purposes. So for example, an interview with a celebrity might be to inform you about this person's life and also entertain you a little bit. Something that an author is reflecting upon their experiences might be to express um, their feelings about what happened to them, but maybe say persuade you to not make the same decisions they did or persuade you that their story could be inspiring. So when you're thinking about about how to analyze an author's work, think about the different purposes and how they might be combined. Purpose, that's the why, also connects with the who, and that is the audience. So anybody can read or access an article, right? Anybody can click on it. But typically, an intended audience is the group of people that the author hopes reads and responds to their work. So in other words, these are the people that an author has in mind while writing. So for example, I said anyone can click on it, right? For an online article, who specifically will click the title to read more? Um, who often subscribes to a certain journal or newspaper? Who might be interested in it? Some of the things that they might keep in mind are things like age, education, gender, or sexuality. So those demographics we talked about. There's other things too, like family background or knowledge of subject area, um, political leanings, religious beliefs, occupations. For example, in these pictures, I've got a, a, a picture of high school, possibly college students there, and then a picture of medical professionals. If I'm writing about how to treat flu symptoms, um, I'm gonna write to younger people and people without that medical expertise a lot differently than I would write to the medical professionals. So for example, I might say, if you have the flu, make sure to drink lots of liquids, particularly water and things that are clear like broth, right? I might tell that to the high school students. With the medical professionals, I might talk about specific ways to prevent dehydration, um, treatments for dehydration if somebody's dehydrated from the flu, recent studies that have been done about the long-term effects of dehydration, I'm going to use terms that a more expert audience would understand that I might have to explain or define for um, a group of younger people or a group of people with um, a little bit less knowledge of that subject area, right? So that's just a, a way to explain the idea of audience. Um, and it's connected to the why, um, why the author's writing. Are they trying to persuade people? Are they trying to just inform them about a subject? And this is also connected to the how, which is where we, <laughs> we talk about tone. Um, with audience, in the presentation I had about audience, I talked about barriers to the audience. So ways that an audience might not listen to your message, right? Here is where tone is going to be particularly important. And if you remember, 
tone indicates the writer's attitude or mood, um, the ideas and feelings that an author has about their subject or about their audience sometimes. So for example, the mood words um, like excited, ambivalent, jubilant and happy or lamenting and sad. Are they cynical about a particular subject or are they hopeful? Are they angry or are they excited? When you're looking at tone, you want to kind of read in between the lines, look for things like diction, that's the author's word choice, as well as the examples and descriptions and narration that they have. So how they feel about the subject and are they trying to make the audience feel similarly to the way that they feel? So once you understand the basics of rhetoric with audience and purpose and tone, then you can kind of start to think about the three types of argument, also known as the three pillars of argument. These are some Greek words that um, were determined or um, thought of, I guess, by Aristotle, not the words themselves, but the fact that these are the three pillars of argument. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Um, so ethos, the same word that we get ethics from, pathos, the same word we get sympathy and empathy from, and then logos, the same word that we get logic from. So I'm going to break down each one of these types of argument and talk about how it might be effective or persuasive to help readers um, do or think whatever the author is trying to get them to do or think or believe or understand. So first is ethos. Um, again, this root word for ethics. So if sometimes when I teach these students get them confused, but if you can remember ethos, ethics, logos, logic, um, that can help. So ethos occurs when an author appeals to readers on the basis of character, morals, and ethics. This can be... Um, using the author's own experience. So you might have something like the authors might have a bio at the end of the article, and it might tell you other things that they've written. It might tell you a little bit about their education, right? So showing that they have the expertise to write about this topic, that could be part of it. People are also more likely to believe you if you are a good person with an upstanding character. So they might have a little bit of, um, discussion about their own character, maybe in comparison to someone else. This happens a lot in politics. I'm going to give you an example in a minute. But it can also be things like citing their sources, um, having reliable research and information. All of those things show that they are a good person of upstanding character. They're showing you where their information came from. Ethos can also come into play with the argument itself. So the argument may have ethical grounds showing that one decision is more moral than another decision. Um, so here is an example where kind of both of these are combined. So think about an election. This um, first individual <laughs> was... Um, John Edwards, a, a candidate from a few years ago, spent taxpayers' money on his mistress while his wife was dying of cancer. So this came out during the election, and the other candidates used it to show that he did not have ethos. So they were saying, hey, I'm a better person than this guy, and therefore you should vote for me. This candidate, um, I'm not sure if this guy was running against him or not. It's from the same area. Let's see if I can zoom in here. There we go. Um, this guy put out uh, these pictures to say, hey, I'm a great husband. I'm a good father. I believe in family values and therefore you should vote for me. And I love this is so <laughs> this picture is so genius because it makes this ethical argument. We have animals, right? Um, we're going to talk about pathos in a minute, but 
playing at people's heartstrings a little bit, but showing, hey, a person who's good to animals will be good to people, right? There he is. Um, he and his wife and his younger son are in black, but they're all wearing blue jeans to show that they're American. Um, and we've got a little bit of red, white, and blue kind of themes going on here with and, and babies, which always um, help. So I can tell you for sure that he did get elected. <laughs> he had such a great photo. Um, so that's what ethics, um, that's what ethos is really about. Trying to appeal to readers on the basis of morals, either through information about yourself as the author or within the actual argument. This choice is more ethical. So the four components of ethos, I actually think I might have five here. But first, trustworthiness. We just talked about that. Does your audience believe you are a good person who can be trusted to tell the truth? Sometimes this might mean for an author, as I said, just citing those sources. Other times it might entails something a little bit more intricate. So they might have to say, this is um, how I've come about this information. This is why I'm an expert in this area. Similarity, does your audience identify with you? If you are someone who has a family and you care about family values, you might vote for the guy I just showed you, who right? Somebody who is similar to you, who loves puppies and babies and who cares about his kids. Um, authority and reputation. Does the author have formal or informal authority relative to their audience? And how much expertise does the audience have in that field? So. If someone is, for example, talking about something like prison reform, have they been in prison before? Um, are they a criminology expert? Have they worked in a prison? And who are they writing to? If they're writing to a general audience of college students who are thinking about going into criminal justice, they might not need necessarily the same type of reputation as if they're talking to a group of people who have worked in criminal justice field for over 25 years, right? Um, so showing that expertise and showing, yes, I have the experience, the wisdom to talk about this subject. Morals and ethics. Which choice is correct based on the morals and values of the author and the reader? So I found these, um, why it's ethical to eat meat, arguments in favor of having a meat-based diet, and then this, vegan for the animals for the planet for ourselves and because it's the right thing to do both of these are ethical arguments they're based in ethos i think that this um even though i'm not a vegan i think that this is a more convincing um description because it's saying for the animals so protect the animals protect the planet be healthier and then this little tagline it's the right thing to do this is a moral argument um, here, it's ethical to eat meat, but they're not really telling you why in this little thing. You have to click it to read the full article. With the vegan one, they're telling you right up front what this article is going to be about. So it's a it's a little bit more encapsulated and, um, and possibly more convincing, unless you really like hamburgers. <laughs> So that's ethos, ethical arguments, trustworthiness, similarity, reputation, morals, ethics. Pathos is the same root word that we get sympathy and empathy. And actually, passion comes from this word as well. So we're going to talk about logic in a, in a moment. But this hides basically a different part of the brain. This is when an author appeals to readers' emotions. These are emotional arguments. Basic emotions, kind of like on this graph, happy, sad, excited, scared, angry. and But a lot of times, trying to figure out the pathos, it's going to be closer to this middle section. It's not going to be quite as strong as sad um, or happy, right? Maybe it'll be slightly opt whoops, maybe it'll be slightly optimistic. Or instead of angry, maybe it'll be slightly irritated. This is kind of like tone, um, except that with pathos, it really is trying to connect 
with a reader's emotions so that the reader feels an emotional pull and is then persuaded to do or think or believe something. So advanced emotions are a lot of times appealed to. Optimism, disappointment, love, contempt, awe, or aggressiveness. How do we find out um, how do we discover pathos? Well, sometimes it's word choice. An author might be appealing to emotions through their words and descriptions. For example, I needed to find a new job versus staring down a future with no prospects. I was desperate to find a new job. Um, the first isn't very emotional, but the second, having no prospects, having desperation, um, that's going to connect with a reader's emotions. Maybe they're worried about their future and they're anxious. Maybe they're depressed and desperate to find a new job or a, a job at all or a better job, right? So there um, is a great example of diction. Here are... Um, they might also use examples. So narrating a story that evokes a certain emotion in a reader, having emotional examples where someone's going through something. Um, it doesn't have to be negative emotions either. Sometimes it can be the use of humor to make readers laugh and convince them of an argument. But here is an example of Otis. Um, so sad, the, the little dog's face. So sad and so sweet. Um, he was adopted, by the way. I checked. Meet Otis. Otis lives in a shelter. He sleeps a lot. There isn't much else to do. When people walk by, op Otis opens his eyes and wags his tail. Then they leave. So he eats and waits and remembers. The smell of home scratches from his owner a squirrel he used to chase it's so sad i can't even read the whole thing you guys it's so sad um so what are they trying to persuade you to do well it's more than just buying pedigree to to help support no-kill animal shelters that's part of it right the other thing though is that this is part of an adoption drive so help dogs like otis find a home take one into your home let them into your heart and then you can help them to not be so sad right i don't know that you can make this argument without having some kind of an emotional pull but even if you could, the pathos here definitely helps. Here's another example. All right, let me zoom in on this. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, just do it. So I am not into sports and I'm not sure who this is, but I really liked this ad because it is trying to make the reader feel inspired even though the ultimate purpose is to sell shoes. Um, the, the other purpose here is to convince them that um, they can do something. Even if they have to make sacrifices, even if it's hard, believe in something, do it, you know you can. Um, it's kind of an inspiring message, or at least it tries to be. So that's basically how pathos works. Um, tone is involved. But it's a little bit more than just the tone. It's emotional language, examples, narration, description that helps to persuade the reader. And next up is logos, the opposite end. So logos refers to a message of internal consistency. So basically logic in a text. Is the claim clear? So clarity of claim, logic of, logic of reasons, and the effectiveness of supporting evidence. So questions you might ask about logic. Um, do all of the reasons for this argument make sense? Does the author have a clear thesis to persuade me, or am I not really sure what they're trying to argue? Um, does the author use research that is recent. Um, that's another good example. What type of research do they have? So if they're just using anecdotes, which are like short stories that are really sympathetic for the reader, but they don't have actual concrete numbers, right? Concrete evidence. So 
Using logic to persuade an audience would include things like studies, news articles, expert opinions, statistics. These are things that you can think about in your own essays as well. If you go to write an argument or you go to write a research paper, if you are using too much logos and there's no ethos, there's no pathos, that's going to be really um, unbalanced. You're going to have a lot of facts and figures um, and sometimes connections, but it might be boring a little bit. If you have too much pathos, there's not going to be really any hard data to back that up. So a lot of times authors use all three of these techniques to persuade their audience. Um, so look for things like, do they have research studies? Are those recent? Have they been verified? Is the research valid? Um, are they manipulating statistics to kind of suit their purposes? Or do they seem to have good unbiased information? So here is an example of strong versus weak evidence. Um, strong evidence that means that it's evidence that helps to convince you. So you can think of strong also meaning convincing. And I'm writing with a mouse here, so you're going to have to bear with me. Um, maybe this was a bad idea. <laughs> convincing. Is it strong? Is it convincing? Does it help persuade the reader? Direct quotations. Um, things directly from, I don't know how that happened, um, things directly from research, um, from experts, from eyewitnesses, those would be direct quotations. Valid studies, multiple pieces of evidence, so different kinds of evidence, not just quote, 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 not just statistic, 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 but um, a convincing argument has different types of evidence research from people with experience and authority. So that goes back to ethos, right? Clear connections. That's also part of logos. Having a mix of things. So do they show that they're an authority in the subject? Do they have an emotionally pulling argument? And then do they have those logical pieces to help um, all work together to convince their reader? Weak evidence would look like, um, we talked about this with Teal, the topic sentence evidence analysis and link. Weak evidence has little support or explanation. So they might give you a statistic, but not really tell you what it means. Um, weak evidence can also be biased writing. Now, sometimes people think that any argument is biased. What biased writing really looks like is they're not showing you anything from what the other side says. Um, they are manipulating data, so making a statistic look worse than it is. So, for example, if... Um, Let's say they interviewed 100 people and um, 10 of them had some type of drug or alcohol use, but maybe out of that 10, like three or four drank once a week, right? Um, they might manipulate that to say 10% of people have issues with alcohol. Well, not really when you actually look at it, right? So that's what manipulating data might look like, skewing statistics to kind of suit their purposes. Are they using outdated studies and research? Again, um, this is something to watch for in your own writing. If they're talking about a subject like Shakespeare, um, what somebody wrote about William Shakespeare in 1940 might be usable. But if they're writing about something like um, immigration in the United States, Something from 1940, unless it's a historical piece, might not really be relevant today, right? So even something that's more than 10 years old, you want to kind of question. Is there no clear connection to the argument? This is something a lot of students fall into as well. Um, do they just have a piece of evidence to have it, but it doesn't really connect to their overall claim? Then it's not as convincing. Over-reliance on pathos and ethos. So I'm a great person, therefore you should listen to me and you should be angry about this subject. Well, why should I be angry about it if there's nothing logical to make me angry about? That's used by a lot of people in the media today. A lot of people in the media are using ethos. Um, social media is built around ethos. Similarity, 
you feel similar to me or you want to be similar to me, you think that you trust me, therefore you should listen to what I have to say. I'm going to make you feel inspired or I'm going to make you feel angry, but is there logic to back that up? And an over-reliance on personal experience. Now, for this one, if it's about someone's life, then that's different. But if they're saying something like, um, there's a controversy about a book right now that is showing life in, in a rural area. And the author is saying, well, all people in this area are like this because I grew up there and here's what my family was like. That's kind of an over-reliance on personal experience. He's not thinking about other people's families and how they might not be like his own, right? So those are some things to look for. Is this convincing? Does it convince you? Does it convince the target audience? Does the author communicate their purpose? What tone do they use when talking about these issues? So let's recap. The modes of persuasion, the three pillars of argument, ethos, ethics, pathos, emotion, and logos, logic. An author has a purpose for writing. They target an audience using a specific tone to convey their feelings and attitudes about a subject. To persuade a reader to think, do, or believe something, they use three techniques. Ethos, appealing to a reader's ethics, values, and morals by creating an ethical argument or demonstrating that they have a solid, trustworthy character. Pathos, appealing to a reader's emotions by using emotional language, examples, narratives, and even sometimes images, as we saw in our examples earlier. And logos, appealing to a reader's logical sensibility by having a clear claim, logically connected reasons, and concrete evidence. So in your readings, think about all of these things and how they work together. Is the author trustworthy? Are they making a moral argument that you agree with? Are they using emotional language and experience and description and narration to kind of draw you into their world and to get you to feel something so that you care about their argument? And last, are they using logic so that you think critically about their argument and then agree with them? All of these three things work together. And once you understand how other authors use these three pillars of argument, you can start using it in your own writing. And that's when things get really exciting. So I can't wait to see what you guys think about the readings this week. And that's it. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. Thanks.